Hello, all my fellow Banksians. As I am the guy behind Banksian Central. My name is Daniel, and uh, I've been tossing about the idea in my mind of creating a, uh, a video uh, to celebrate the 40th anniversary of A Curious Feeling. Uh, you know, for a couple of months now, I've been thinking about it. And I thought, well, you know, what, what better a time than to come out from behind the, uh, the keyboard, as it was, you know, to make a, make a more personal video <clears throat> of giving my thoughts on the album and such. And the, uh, considering the fact that it's been 40 years now, Initially, The Curious Feeling came out in October of 1979. Came out, you know, nine years before I was even born. I didn't uh, discover the album until, well, you know, that was much. At the time that I discovered A Curious Feeling, the album was already close to being... Uh, 30 years old, yeah. I discovered it during the summer of 2007. Uh, when I initially got into Tony's solo work, originally, as it, as it was, I, I got into, well, first off, I got into Phil, and then I got into Genesis, and then I got into Tony. Uh, that was the progression. Like, I got into Phil. First off, I got into Phil back in probably late 2006. And then, and then I got into Genesis back in early 2000. <clears throat> seven uh, and then I got into Tony's solo stuff I suppose about April of 2007 March or April around that time and I wanted to get some of his solo albums so I got onto eBay and I found some listings for some and it was around that time that I uh, graduated from high school. And I kind of used that as an opportunity to request some of Tony's albums as, as a gift from my mom. And, and she got on, she, she bought me two at the time. First off, I, I remember I got Fugitive. I got the fugitive first because I got into This Is Love and and that song. You know, I really, really loved that song at the time and and I really wanted to hear more of Tony's singing and at the time I couldn't really find too much online for it because back then YouTube wasn't really didn't have as much as it does now. I mean now you can find pretty much everything. But um, back then it was considerably harder to find stuff because people were just were just adding to it at that at that time. And um, well, I got the fugitive first, and then it was a couple of weeks later. I believe it was June of two thousand seven that I got a curious feeling, which. <clears throat> I got it on CD. First off, it was, uh, I think, like the UK release on Virgin, which is right here. My, my first exposure to a curious feeling came from this right here. And, and I recall at the time, 
during that summer listening to a curious feeling. But um, but initially, the album, I recall, I enjoyed it. Like musically, I thought it was, it was great. But it really did take a while for me to truly appreciate the the story within the album. It was, um, you know, Curious Feeling is a concept album based, it was originally based upon Flowers for Algernon, which, which I found out back at that time, after listening to the album and everything, I was kind of curious about what it was all about. And then I, you know, read into it and found out it was based on, upon that novel. And I was interested in reading the novel and I tracked it down at my library in town and checked it, checked it out and then I, and I read it, which, um, which I believe I actually have that book on my shelf. Yes, Flowers for Algernon. It's the same book I checked out back then, actually. I actually, um, well, I, I kept this book from the library. You know, wasn't supposed to do that, but. I really like that cover, and so I, I ended up paying for the book, which is actually cheaper than what I would have had to have paid for that book, new, from like Books a Million or something. So I just decided to keep that anyway. I uh, I read the book and I thought it was fantastic, very, you know, very uh, emotional book. Really, I, I don't believe I've actually read that book since that time. It's about the fall of 2007 is when I read it. I need to reread that, really. I may do that sometime soon. But, um, yeah, so I read that book. And, uh, actually, I've seen the movie that was based on that book, too. Uh, Charlie. Good, good movie as well. But anyway. Uh, yes, uh, like I was saying, uh, yeah, it was, uh, back during the fall of 2007, I checked out that book and I read it and, um, but it wasn't until, you know, much later that I, uh, truly began to understand the story of the uh, of the album because it was when Tony initially wrote the album he wanted it to be based really solely upon Flowers for Algernon and he got in contact with uh, Daniel Keyes who wrote the book but he told him you know he was fine with him he contacted Daniel Keyes to get permission to do it, which he had no problem with it. But he said that there was going to be a Broadway play put on for the, uh, it was going to be based on the book as well. And Tony kind of thought, you know, if that's the case, and he didn't really know how well it was going to do, so he ended up changing the story around. And of course, well, the play ended up kind of running for a brief period of time and that was that and then when all that happened Tony had already changed everything so he just kind of stuck with what he had done and um and then he recorded the album as being something different which to me I, 
personally, I, I, I think kind of slightly going in a different direction than he did was, was good. Because, I, I mean, I, I really love the story of the album. But, like I said at the time, I didn't really understand it. It, was, um, it wasn't until a couple of years later that I really got into really got into the album. It was um, the fall, um, well, no, the spring. Yeah, this the spring of 2010 that uh, that I began to listen to a Curious Feeling. I guess I, I believe I remember at the time I, I picked it up and began to listen to it. Um, I began to really uh, connect with the main character of the album. And uh, I remember I used to go out late at night and drive around town and just just blare the album. And, you know, raise the windows down in the truck that I had at the time and just, just listen to the album. Just, just crank it and listen to it. Yeah, those were the days. You know, and really good time. Uh, like I said, I really got into the, uh, the album at that time and began to really understand the, um, the story of it, which was which was that of, of it being a base based upon a. story of a man who's like consciously losing his mind where it goes from track to track detailing you know each of his story progressing along along those lines which um you know looking over each of the particular tracks like in my mind what I began to listen to and, and, and put into into the story and understanding it was um, which has basically built up over the years but began kind of back in 2010 it was like from the undertow was like to me the um, from the undertow was a dream sequence that took place within the main character's mind of him remembering a time of which he was out on a ship captain he was the captain of the ship out on the ocean of just remembering being out on the water and in control of this of this vessel and, uh, and just remembering a time a time from the past in which his life was totally different and, uh, and lucky me was him waking up from that dream and uh, where you know, which is it's, it's in the present, and he's totally, totally different person. You know, like a, his his mind, he's a bit more simple minded, I suppose. When his life is certainly, he he's just kind of living day to day. Going back and forth to work, holding down a menial job, which is kind of what I connected with at the, <clears throat> in 2010. And, uh, and um, you know, him and, and, and having friends who kind of tell him that he should think 
try to remember like who he was, but he's happy. <clears throat> he's happy the way that he is now. There's um, <clears throat> no reason for him to, or desire for him to want to go back to how, who he was before. And um, the lie takes a jump back in time to, to when the main character was a child, about 30, <clears throat> 30 some, you know, odd years before. And uh, it's just, he's running around by himself out in the woods, making these, these packs of Rabbits running along the rabbit will like run down a hole or run past the hole if it if it goes down the hole and then then the ground beneath will disappear and obviously you know they're just childish games but then you know he comes up with the with the pact of you know If he, when he grows up, he, you know, if he never falls in love, you know, he, you know, he'll be famous, you know, be wise, and, and this, this being in the woods, you know, demon or whatever else, overhears it. Actually, makes the pact. Instead of it being a game, it's actually, it's actually the real deal. Of course, the main character, you know, just kind of talks with this this being or whatever about having this pact or whatever, but he doesn't really believe it. You know, kind of shrugs it off. You know, almost not believing that it really happened. And um, after the lie was, um, you know, flash forwarding a couple years or whatever, the main character is older when the benefits of this pact are beginning to come, come to pass. And uh, his life is beginning to change. Coming, you know, more becoming wiser and more um, influential, and uh, and everything you know that he he had agreed to in the pact is starting to come to pass, and um, and a curious feeling it's obviously um well the about the peak of that of that pact where everything is like kind of going smoothly with, with what he agreed to he, he has everything that he that he had uh, that he was promised um and forever mourning Kind of, um, I like to think of Forever Morning, I suppose, as being taking place before the, the, the main character ends up meeting who, who he's ultimately going to fall in love with. Um, like he, I don't know, he, he meets them. But he doesn't fall in love with them. Like he, he just kind of um, just the beginning, I suppose, stages of maybe developing feelings for them. 
along those lines. And then, of course, one of the next track, you things come in full on where he actually does fall in love with her. Which I like to think of you as being the climax of the album. Backed with the awesome keyboard solo at the end. Fantastic stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, you just has, has things go like he just, you know, just completely embraces falling in love. And, um, and the next track, Somebody Else's Dream, obviously, everything that he had, had agreed to in the pact, just, um, it's like, you know, he agreed to not fall in love and everything, you know, it's just like falling apart, you know, little, little by little at first, um, I would like to imagine it was a gradual thing that he just begins to notice things within himself starting to slip away little by little. And he thinks back to the past to, to this pact that he had made and he doesn't, he's not really sure if it actually happened or if everything that was in his mind was actually happening. Um, and just thinking, you know, It's kind of a, <clears throat> I'd like to think of it as kind of being, you know, kind of like, I don't know, a stage of acceptance with it being, it's, I look at it as being like a very, kind of like an angry track mixed in with the sadness um, as well. Um, and uh, the waters of, of Lethe. Obviously, kind of, it's, it's a more calm track, but it, I'd like to think of that one as a piece where the uh, the main character is kind of over the course of that track, kind of comes to an acceptance of what's happening to him, and it has a real, you know, it has a real sadness to it. Kind of d depression, I suppose. Um, mixed in there but at the end, you know, it has acceptance um, you know, for a while. Obviously, is a full-on acceptance of what's happening, and uh, and realizing that, that you know that what's happening is is going to happen one way or another character just realizes, you know, things were good for a while, but, you know, kind of being happy for, for what, it, happy in the end for what he had experienced, you know, going through all of that, and um, obviously in the dark, this very end where things are kind of just ending with um, both the album and, and things wrapping things up with the main character and uh, and um, within that track the main character is basically staying you know Anyone who, who knows him knows of what he's been through. And I can tell them about, about what all has happened, but he doesn't really want to know about it. That he'd rather just remain in the dark, and maybe one day he'll, he'll be able to find out about the past, but, but to just basically just not to really 
talk to him about it. And that's, uh, I mean, that's my thoughts on the story. Basic thoughts. I mean, uh, so I could probably go into much further detail about it if I thought thought on it. But you know, I mean, that, that's that's what I thought. And I have thought over the years on on the, on the story of the album. Um, like I said, I got into it back in two thousand ten. Really hit hard with me, and uh, and it's uh, something that's remained with me for you know, years. It's and it remains since that time of being something. It's an album that I would certainly call my all-time favorite album because it moves me every time I listen to Curious Feeling. It moves me. I. I I don't really like to just listen to one particular track when I listen to it, although sometimes I kind of listen to like keyboard solos within you and like after the lie because those are really real standouts to me on the album. But um, I really do like to listen to it as a, as a whole. And every time I listen to it, I mean, it moves me to tears. It's just something. It's it's a you know, beautiful album, very very melancholic album, which I can definitely say I, I really do enjoy the feeling of the album. I mean, a, a lot of Tony's music, I feel, has that within it, which I suppose is it's a big reason why. I, got into his music, how it's uh, touched me on a number of levels throughout the years. Um, and obviously, I mean, uh, well, I have have multiple copies of, of the album now, so originally it uh, Originally, I just had this one. That's where it all started from. But uh, later on, I got the original vinyl. The original vinyl that was, you know, got it up on, on eBay in a in like a bundle deal with like about three or four other of Tony's albums. Then I got, then I ended up getting this one years later, when it was, you know, back in 2016. Got the esoteric vinyl release of it, which is awesome cover. Uh, oops, I got I got this on vinyl twice. Uh, Original 30th anniversary release from Esoteric with the DVD 5.1, all that. Not too easy finding this one these days. The uh, hardcover version, and um, then obviously there's the CD, kind of the jewel case version, which is essentially the same thing, just cosmetically it's different. Um, got it on cassette. Got a pin. A badge I got from a buddy of mine a couple of years back. Buddy of mine, Alan. Yes, Alan Hewitt. The name I'm sure will sound familiar. From some people. Very good guy. Help me out. 
we had a, you know, not just with that, but also the guy he's helped me out a couple of times. And uh, also have some singles. But I, uh, I forgot to bring those out. But I, I have a couple singles for, for a while. But a bit, uh, maybe a bit more of a rarity, kind of what I have connected to the album, not vocalist-wise connected. Obviously, the vocalist for Curious Feeling is Kim Beacon, who, who actually went on to have put out two solo albums. And also did other other music, but didn't really never really put out any other albums. But actually have his uh, two solo albums, which are really good stuff. They have Ravana there, and and, uh, and the more rare one, which I've yet to. yet to uh, put this one on YouTube. I want to eventually. It's a really good album as well. Talking to myself. Real good album. But, um, that's about, uh, my thoughts really on the album. Um, kind of thinking of pretty much hit every point. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, I've, what is I, I guess like one other thing that I have probably the, the jewel of my a curious feeling collection. Um, This awesome ad. Really cool. I've had for a couple of years. But, um, yeah. Also got that off eBay. A lot of cool stuff on eBay. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, those are my thoughts for the on the curious feeling. Maybe I'll end up, maybe I'll make a, a video for when the fugitive turns 40, and that's like four years from now. Yeah, maybe I will. I don't know, we'll see. But, uh, the Curious Feeling was a very special one for me. I definitely I wanted to do something, like I said, special to signify the turn of 40, my thoughts and such. So, I think that's about it. I've rambled on, I think, enough about that. So, yeah. Appreciate you, all you Banksians out there, all of the support over the years, watching the videos and subscribing. Um, anybody who is watching, who isn't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Subscribe. I mean, if you like Tony, why not? I mean, it's, it's the best place to really come and look at stuff for Tony. Not just because I'm the one putting it out there, but, you know, I still have stuff in, in my, in my vault that's just been, it's been called that I haven't put out there of, 
of stuff for Tony. Like, uh, you know, some, you know, some, some videos I've, I've yet to upload and, uh, and some, some scans from some, some music, you know, musical, uh, some, uh, some pages from the Quicksilver score that I've, I've yet to uh, upload. I need to do that. But, you know, that's, that would probably go on the Facebook page at some point. Anyway, yeah, that's about it, I suppose. Thanks again for, for watching. And, uh, I really appreciate it. Hope you liked the video. And that's it for me. Alrighty.